Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. Here at Cavanagh's HR, we're getting ready to launch a crowdfunding campaign on Refunder. To get more information and become an early investor, and of course, learn about all the risks involved, go to HTTPS um, refunder.com slash Cavanagh's HR. I always forget that little hyphen thing in there, right? Yeah. Also, on July 25th, we're doing a pitch competition at the Warren Time Blue Incubator on July 25th. There's still time to sign up for that. Our guest is Garrett King. Garrett, you ready to be great today? Yes, it's a great day to have a great day. Let's so Garrett, um, talk about your hiking stuff. How long have you been doing hiking? Yeah, um, I grew up hiking. So I'd say from a young age, it was something that was kind of ingrained into a lifestyle. And I think as a kid, I didn't fully appreciate it. <laughs> Just being growing up in the Pacific Northwest, having access to so many great forests and national parks kind of took advantage of it. And then later in my life, as I went more into tech and things like that, I really started to appreciate my time outside, my time away from cell service, <laughs> um, not, not being connected and just being in nature. I think there's some cool studies on how the physiology of your body changes when you're outdoors. So yeah, I love it. You get some exercise, you get fresh air. Um, it's a great, great activity with friends that I really enjoy. Yeah, I have to say probably, I'll make this number, at least 97% of people in the Seattle area like, love to go hiking, right? And yeah. I, 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 mean, I wonder what is that, you know, like you have the Appalachian Trail, Smoky Mountain, Rock, Mountains, Rockies, they, they, they have that much of a love of being outside, right? Yeah. And of course, the weather's pretty nice, right? Like, you're not hiking outside in Phoenix, Arizona right now, right? Correct. I, I've done some warmer hikes, but um, yeah, I mean, this last weekend I did just like a 16-mile backpacking trip just in the Alpine Lakes wilderness here in... in uh, Washington, Washington, especially just has some of the most beautiful trails. So I have yet to explore a lot of the stuff on the East coast, uh, lived in Austin for a quick stint. So uh, there are little Hills there, you know, I hiked, but yeah. So, um, how long, have you been hiking since you were a little kid or something you started as an adult? Yeah, I'd say since a little kid, I think I've gotten more into it and I've done longer hikes. So one thing that I'm planning for I haven't put on the the calendar yet but I want to do the portion of the PCT trail that goes from Snoqualmie Pass to Stevens Pass okay I think it's about 70 miles or just shy of that so it'd be about a five-day backpacking trip um, off grid which would be fun that's kind of what I'm building up toward um, what, yeah. what, what's the trail I think it's from like Southern California all the way up to the north I remember someone reading someone did that a while ago yeah I think that's probably the PCT the Pacific okay. Crest trail okay um i forget how long is until it's got to be a couple thousand miles yeah. but yeah some people take take a few months and do that whole thing yeah it's like kind of like as long as the appalachian trail right um yeah i'm not familiar with that one as much but i yeah. think there there's some similarities uh, yeah, i think that one goes from like you know from georgia all the way up to like new hampshire or something like yeah. that yeah so what's your like two-part question what's your like hardest one you've done so far and what's your, like your go-to hike like friends come to visit yeah. and they say let's go to hike you, you know you don't like, like, you know, burn a mountain or that. I still take this kind of easy hike, you know? Great question. Yeah. I, being in Seattle, we're lucky to be so close to uh, so many great hikes. I'd say the easiest, like accessibility wise, would be Rattlesnake, but it gets really busy. Um, I like to shoot up to Issaquah and just out a little bit from there. There's a trail called Poo Poo Point. So aside from having a hilarious name, um, it's a cool little couple mile, like it's, intermediate maybe but it's nice like you can get off work at like three o'clock go and do the hike watch the sunset uh watch some people like paraglide off i think that's what it's called um and then you know hike back down to your car all in the evening which is nice so it's really accessible yeah i definitely got to do a timer right because i've tried to do some hikes like man you got to park like twenty thousand miles away because yep. all the cars there right it's like man like plus you also nature it. like all these cars are in here right yeah yeah uh and then to answer your question on the hardest I think it was recently I climbed Mount Adams mm -hmm. um, and that sure. was more of a trek with friends. I, you park at the trailhead or we parked at the trailhead. Some people take like a couple days to do it. Parked at the trailhead, you know, slept in the, slept in the truck and then get up at like 3 AM mm -hmm. and you start trekking up the mountain and we brought our snowboards up so we could just nice. cruise down. So nice. I want to hike a long time ago and it's like me and my wife went together. It's like, she like, no, she didn't, she, she saw the saw the hike said, I'm gonna stay here, right? And drink some yeah. water, right? And uh the hike ended at some kind of glacier, right? So it's like pretty steep. Yeah. You know, you gotta you hike like, man, I can't go back now, right? 
Mm-hmm. But man, I paid for the hike like two or three days. Like, I was not in shape at all, right? My legs hurt. Like, man, I, like yeah. you know, he's like, I can't punk out now. Like, the, I don't know when this hike's gonna end, but you know, yeah, I've gone like 30, 40 minutes already, right? And it, yeah, that's, I think that's part of the reason I like hiking is it's just as much of a mental game mm-hmm. as it is a physical game. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you need the physical endurance and things like that. But a lot of it is just mental, especially yeah. when you're on like a multi day backpacking trip. Mm-hmm. It's like, you don't have sales service. You don't have your amenities. It's like what you packed on your back yeah, and then what you can find in nature and you got to make it work. And so, yeah. Yeah. One more time, a long time to a thing called Northwest Flattery, like the northernmost part of Washington, Flattery Peak, whatever. Okay. I was up there walking around stuff and I seen a sign that said, uh, mountain lions and bears have been sighted, but you're no danger. Like what? What are you talking about? But no danger. You know, like, I- you know, you can't even write, like they said, still camp. You want to, you know, like what? Yeah. I was in the Olympic National Forest uh, a couple of years ago with my brothers, and we saw probably 15 black bears mm. that trip. We had the wilderness permits for the overnight camping, and I got a little startled. I was just, we were just cruising on the trail, and there was like a younger black bear just 10 feet in front of me, just barreled across the trail. Yeah. And he was on a mission to go find some blueberries or something, but it was just like, whoa, he's right there. Like, not, not something you want to run into. And that's not what's going to rely on God and nature. Like, no, like nature's everywhere. Like, it's just not us in the city, right? Yeah. Like, you know, like bears, lines, or what are you going to wear? Like, you know, like we're hunting with a friend like a couple years ago, elk hunting in um by Ellensburg. Oh, yeah. And that's, you just see all the, you just hear the nature, right? Like, yeah. oh, wow, this is, this is kind of close, right? Like, yeah. It's, it's insane. There's a lot out there. And I, you get out there at night too, and you can see all the stars. You don't have light pollution. You just realize, like, whoa, there's so much out there. So, so on a scale from one to 10, what would you consider your hiking expertise? Oh, uh, I don't know how to gauge that very well. I'd say a middle of the road, maybe like, slightly above average like six by five. Six, six. Yeah. We'll call it, you know, six or seven, maybe. Yeah. So what's some good, um, and obviously this is not your reward house, but what's some good, like yeah. someone says, I'm gonna start doing like two or three more hikes once in a while. What like some yeah. starters, like starters, like starter shoes, starter backpacks, you know? Yeah. Uh, no, this is great. I, I could talk about hiking all day. So <laughs> this is fun. Um, the resources I use to kind of figure things out for like what I want for hiking, it's a mixture. So um, REI, it's got a lot of experts. It's great. I just go there and chat with them. It's my favorite store to go to. Uh, my coworker, old, you know, coworkers would just joke, you know, some people love to go to the mall and shopping and all this stuff. It's just like, I'm at REI, I'm checking out gear. I'm looking at what's next. Um, there's a website called outdoorgearlab.com. I believe that's the URL. Maybe I'll find the link and shoot your way, but they're kind of a third party and they rate gear. So they're not, there's not the bias of like, oh, we're getting paid promotions on things, but you're like, uh, just the other month, I was like, I need to pick up new trekking poles. I want them to be light because I'm going to do, you know, long hikes with them. So I went to Outdoor Gear Lab. I looked at their ratings of like all the different trekking poles. And I landed on some MSR um, trekking poles that were super light and really well rated. Um, So that was a good resource. Um, You know, REI is great for outfitting you with boots. They'll try out a bunch. And then, you know, you can walk on their little trails around their campus and stuff to try them out. Um, But yeah, those are some of the resources I use. And then Pretty much every time I'm on the trail or camping or backpacking, I'm having conversations with people I'm like seeing like, oh, that's a really cool tent or like, oh, those boots are awesome. Like, or what do you think about, you know, those poles? So, yeah. So I'm guessing if you go hike the first time, don't go on sandals, right? Yeah. I mean, the flops, you know, <laughs> probably not a good idea. It all just depends. It's funny. I have a friend growing up that kind of did, he did a pretty long hike in some Chaco sandals. Oh, wow. And, you know, you get some blisters and stuff, but like. That just sounds painful. Walking those <laughs> sandals. It does. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is like, know your limits. Mm-hmm. Um, push yourself if if you want to push yourself mentally and, you know, but still enjoy the experience and lean into it and learn from it. I think is the most important thing if if you want to do it long term. Um, but yeah, everyone has such a different, you know, experience and skill level. And so try to figure out where to start and then just go from there. That's what and, I would say. And, and trek a pose, I'm guessing that, you know, a lot of people think trek a pose or walking six or four, if you're like 85 years and above, right. Everyone to actually use trek and pose, right? 
Yeah. So this is something that I'm, I'm what 31 now. So I, and I'm putting a lot of weight on my back, like snowboard, like my pack's getting up to like 50, 60 pounds. And I was reading some, some studies and I don't know if I can find them or not, but basically you're, 30% more efficient with your energy when you're using trekking poles is what I was reading. And so I was like, okay, I need to test these out. And sure enough, as I'm using trekking poles, my energy, I feel like is being used more efficiently. I can go longer, I can go further. And so, yeah, it's not just for old people with knee problems. It's like, (laughs) or, you know, it's really helpful for anyone. So. Yeah. And when you go hiking, you always go camping at the same time. You like fix it up and stuff like that. Oh, I switch it all up. Sometimes it's a quick day hike, um, you know, getting out to poopoo point real quick after work or something, uh, work day in Seattle, or sometimes I try to get more off grid and, you know, get up to Icicle Creek outside of Leavenworth or things like that. So, so camping, you, you actually need to get like permission to camp, right? Like what, you have to get a permit depending on where you go to, I'm guessing. Yeah, don't quote me on any of this, like go and do your research on what's legally there. But I know there's a lot of different options, you can like do the reservation with like state parks, um, or national, there's, there's options in national forests and things like that. Also, a lot of times in national forests, you can do what's called dispersed camping. So as long as you're, you know, always pack in pack out, you know, leave it better than you found it. Don't leave any trash, right. But like, you can just find spots off of forest service roads and just camp out for the night. So I've done that before. Um, and then sometimes like if I'm climbing somewhere like Mount Adams, like you do need a wilderness permit. So you have to go, um, it's federal. You got to go and get your permit for these set of days. And we'll just like camp out at the parking lot, um, the night before the hike or in the wilderness. Yeah. So you do need to check just, it's kind of different with different areas. There's state parks, there's federal land, I'm trying to think there are definitely, you could Google it, I'm sure, and find like, where can I camp? There's some cool apps out there that show you like, this is DNR land, this is National Forest, um, this is what's allowed here and what's not. So a lot of different options. If you go hiking, your safety is pretty much on your own thing, right? Like you really can't, you know, count on the Seattle police are coming out or park rangers, like you're out there camping, it's like you're on your own, right? you like, yeah. you have to take all the precautions you need to do. Yeah, for sure. I... It's something I think about for sure, especially the older I get, like your, your safety. I love, you know, always recommended to go with a group. Uh, I always let people know where I'll be, when they can expect to hear from me, when I come back into town. And when you go, do you just sleep, you, do, you actually use a tent, you just use a sleeping bag or a combination? I've done a bunch of different things. Yeah. I sometimes I just sleep in like a bivy sack, sleeping bag on the ground. Can you imagine like sleeping in a bivy sack and you just that some berries start shaking you all back and forth? I you know. know. I mean, I feel like that happened like probably less than zero percent, but it's like, yeah. You have to think about it, right? Yeah. And one thing, especially for when you're going to wilderness areas, you bring bear canisters, mm-hmm. you put all your food in there. Oh, yeah. And you yeah. put that away from your camp. Yeah. So you're not sleeping with your food because you don't want to wake up and have a bear mm-hmm. sniffing around your face. Um, yeah, I've done a hammock before, kept it super lightweight. And then I've had, you know, backpacking tents and things like that. Nice. And then what do you usually do for food? Like, I'm, I'm guessing you can't like, you know, call, get on your phone, call an Uber Eats or Instacart, right? Right, right. You like bring like canned food or beef jerky or you like do campfires or you like go fishing somewhere and like catch fish and, and cook it. Yeah, I so I'm not a skilled, I'm not a skilled fisherman, uh, but I have had friends who have caught a fish up in Alpine Lakes. Um, most of the time, like if it's a multi-day trip, I'll try to pack as light as possible. So that means like freeze dried meals. You go to REI, you pick up, these little bags of freeze dried, you know, chicken marinara or chicken pad thai or different things like that. And you just boil water in a jet boil, put it in the sack, let it sit for 20 minutes or so. And then voila, you got dinner. Um, but yeah, I, the, the key really is to try to pack as light as possible. And this is where like, there's groups on Facebook and a lot of other places and you start to build this community and you start to talk about like, oh, what'd you bring to eat? What'd you bring to eat? And everyone's kind of sharing their favorite, like hiking meals and camping meals. And it's kind of fun. Yeah. So when you go hiking, is there like, um, do you have, a, okay, no, let me backtrack. Yeah. So I think a lot of people will say, you're going to go camping for three days. How boring. Like, what are you doing? I could never do camp for three days. Like, what would your response to be? Like, ex- like, you know, how would you convince that? No, it's not boring. You don't do this for like three days. Yeah, I think if that's kind of your attitude going into it, you're probably right. <laughs> and it probably will be boring for you, or you might not enjoy the experience. Um, what I really value about the experience is that it it's a forcing function to just be present. 
there's no distractions. Um, there's not your phone buzzing, your email going off. It's just, you're there with your own thoughts for better or for worse. And you're forced to be present and really tune in to what's around you, the people you're with, um, you know, the scenery, what you're trying to accomplish, where you're going. And, uh, I, I love that about that. And I really value it. Um, there's always something beautiful to look at too. So if you're, if you're looking for it. So I'm pretty sure you have plenty of answers to this one, but what's something you've been out of nature and you're like, oh, wow, this is like, I can't believe I, I get to see this, right? Like, this is so outstanding, so beautiful. Like, I, yeah. I just can't believe I'm, this, I'm looking at this right now. That is a tough question to answer. Um, the few things that come to mind, I think just a moment of awe that I've had while hiking and camping has just been no light pollution, up in the Alpine, meaning like, you know, 6,000 plus feet of elevation up in a mountain. And you just look up on a clear night and you just see all the galaxies and all the stars. I think it's just incredible. Um, just, it's so much to soak in. It's overwhelming, but it's just so beautiful. The other thing is just trees. <laughs> as, as nerdy or weird as that sounds, like I've read books on trees and stuff and I, I find it super fascinating you know, how they work in community and communicate through fungi and uh, fungi is another thing. Like there's so much fungi on our planet that we're still understanding and how it connects us as humans and connects plants. And there's just, it might sound so nerdy, but there's so many things to look at while you're out there and just things you'll never see in a city. You'll never see, um, you know, in the suburbs, it's certain fungi, certain plants, um, eating fresh blueberries in the mountain that are better than any blueberries you've ever bought in a store. Uh, you can't beat it. Just make sure you don't eat the blueberries at the same time the black bears are there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You don't want to be munching at the spot where the black bears are going next. So does your family go with you too? Yeah. I've camped with a lot of, uh, a lot of my family, uh, more so like car camping, you know, with, got some nieces and nephews and they're getting into it now too. So it's, it's fun to go car camping, but then I'd say both my brothers have gone on backpacking trips with, which is great. So when you suppose you meet someone and they talk about, they're going to go into a uh, camping and you like, they're taking this 20,000 foot RV, like Chris, all that kind of stuff. You like to look at them like, you're not camping guy. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? Like, you're not camping, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't, so I don't, I try not to cast any judgment. Right. But I think there is a different, different ways to define the word camping. And that can mean different things for different people. So all of it's good. I think the more you can get out to a new place, get out in nature, I'm all for it. So if you need to take an RV to do it, like, great, do it. But at least um, get out the RV, right? Yeah, but like go don't, and at least go yeah. hiking for a day. or yeah, Don't stay in the RV and watch the internet all the time. Like at least get out and yeah. walk around, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's super healthy for people, so... So you said like when you go camp, you let someone know you're at. What what does someone do? Like they're out camping and like something bad happens, right? Like no cell service. Like I, I think the new iPhones have like this kind of some kind of satellite thing where I know it's like satellite phones you use. I'm sure most people don't take satellite phones. They're hiking. But like what should someone do? They're hiking. Like oh shit! Like yeah, you know, I, I I don't broke my bone. Did something bad, you know? And there's no way to contact people. For sure, uh, definitely talk to some trained professionals. I know you can do. Like uh, you can do courses in wilderness safety and like first aid. Um, and I'm usually with friends who have done those courses. So I think that's a level of perceived security for me is like, oh, I know you've done this wilderness first aid course. And so if something happens, you kind of have some tools and resources to address on the scene. Um, and, you know, I've been fortunate. I think that's part of like knowing your limit. There's always things that are out, outside of your control, but like knowing where you're at and not going beyond that. Uh, but then the other thing is there's a lot of cool technology, like you're mentioning. I've never tested anything with the iPhone. I know that I, I use the satellite maps to navigate still, uh, which is really helpful. I know there's a lot of like Garmin GPS units that you can send out signals, you can send messages. So if you do encounter that, like anytime I'm mountaineering, like doing Mount Adams, I'm with people that have that technology. So they can come and airlift you if needed. When you go hiking either by yourself or a group of people, so you feel like you're no more concerned as far as safety. Yeah, like, am I concerned or? Uh, no, like, what's your no more concern? Like, you're gonna oh. you're gonna hike like after this podcast. What, what what's your concerns like as far as safety and stuff? I would say, you know, I think I I plan and I prepare and I don't 
I, yeah, I don't necessarily have. But everything's planned out. You don't it, and you know what to expect, not to expect. Yeah, I I think part of that comes with experience, but then part of it is like, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And as long as you're trying to be as wise and and smart about it and responsible, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to be irresponsible and put somebody else's life in danger. Like there are, especially when you're doing something like Mount Adams, right? You want to have the right resources, the right training, because then if you're irresponsible, you're putting, you know, search and rescue has to come out. You're putting their lives at risk. So I think just balancing the, the risk with, you know, training and planning and doing the best you can. Um, it's a balance for sure. But I think when you're there, like lean into the experience and, and, and what's your take on this? Like, you know, it happens all the time. Like pose there a sign on Trump's trail says, don't go on this trail. It's dangerous, blase, blase. And someone will go on the trail. They'll fall down the cliff and you got to bring search and rescue, rescue them, you know, all this taxpayer money. Do you think that person who like, like did not obey or not follow the guidelines of the trust have to pay that money back or is this taxpayers should take care of that or oh, gosh that's a big question i don't know if i have an opinion on that directly i think it's something to consider i think my you know whenever i'm chatting with friends or people that are enthusiastic about getting out there i try to provide them with all the resources to not get in that situation you know and chat through and ask questions um I think at some, I know at some point, I think you are actually, I don't know. I don't know. I, I thankfully have not been in this position. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know if you get airlifted, obviously that's something you have to pay for. Okay. You're responsible yeah. for, and people like that do mountaineering and I haven't got to this level, but people that do mountaineering a lot, will make sure they buy insurance okay. on that specifically. Mm-hmm. So there's a system in place okay. for it. Cause I understand you want to be adventurous, yeah. but if the sign says don't yeah. go to this place, I mean, someone put that for a reason right? right but some people still like you know or like all the time don't cross this river or don't go swimming here right yeah, yeah i'll do it anyway yeah and i think that's part of knowing your limits i i, I feel like there is some level of you are taking on responsibility mm-hmm. if, if someone has told you directly like this is the danger that comes with this activity like yeah that responsibility now then shifts to you when you have been communicated to like that so any plans to do a mark rainier i think someday yeah mm-hmm. uh no no set in stone plans, but it's definitely on the list. It's like a bucket listing. Yeah. Of course, you know, you got to find the right people to do with that, I'm guessing. Yeah. Like you just can't find, I've never hiked before in my life. I want to go tomorrow, right? For sure. I feel there's a lot of training you got to do and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Process, apply, get the right equipment. Rainier is a lot of glaciers and crevasses. So it's like, you've got to be roped up. You've got to have training for that, for sure. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of stuff you like to do with your family that's not hiking or camping? I know you like to spend a lot of time with them. Yeah. Uh, what comes to mind right away is just food. Food oftentimes, right, is the centerpiece for many social gatherings, but I love cooking. I love sharing a meal. Um, you know, I I like a variety of activities. So I've got nieces and nephews now that are growing up, and it's really fun to see the joy and the awe and the wonder in their eyes as they're exploring new things. Um, recently mountain biking, uh, camping again, you know, introducing them to that experience um, or something as simple as jumping on the trampoline or, you know, just spending that time. It's, it's really fun to see life through their fresh eyes um, and, and life experiences. Um, But yeah, other than that, traveling enjoying the beautiful scenery around the area. I, you'll, you'll hear this theme in my life a lot. Like I'm always trying to get outside mm-hmm. and be outside. Thanks. So. so moving to something else. So you got your master's in entrepreneurship to you, Mr. Washington, right? I did. Yeah. Of course, I know several people into the program, all great people. I asked you the same question I asked them. Like, like most people say you can't learn entrepreneurship in school, right? You have to go do it right. Mm-hmm. But everyone says, no, it was actually a good experience. Can you talk about your experience at UW internship school? Yeah, this will be my plug for the master's entrepreneurship program at UW. Uh, I think it's a phenomenal program. I go back every year, chat with students, see if I can be helpful in their projects and and launching their ideas. Um, I'd say it's not necessary. Like if you are an entrepreneur and considering it, the program's not necessary. There's tons of resources. We live in the age of information. You can go and Google whatever you need. You can 
go hop on a machine learning language model and chat with them and get things you need. You know, there's so many resources these days. What was useful about that program specifically is that it really accelerated learning for me. I knew that I could go and Did learn. you already have your startup like in mind? Was your startup, was, was Perfect Water already, Perfect Car for already in business, getting revenue? Or was it like an idea when you started? It was an idea. And I think they designed the program. They, it's the most beneficial when you have an idea in mind and you go through the stages of like validating the idea and testing and ideating. And um, you kind of go through four different stages in the program, which I'm forgetting the title of those stages, but it is helpful to have an idea in mind. Um, but I think the biggest benefit too, just aside from the classes, because I think all that material, like managerial accounting or finance or marketing, you can go and do an online course and learn all that, but it's a community. Nothing can replace community and having a cohort of 25 students. So that's what mine was. I know it's grown since then, but having a cohort that you're coming together in person, you're learning together, you're able to ask them questions, you're helping them with their projects, they're helping you. It's that energy and that uh, excitement uh, coupled with, you know, the program did a really great job of introducing us to the ecosystem in Seattle for entrepreneurship. So whether it was angel investors or, you know, venture capitalists or other founders of startups, a um, lot of cool experiences, a lot of founders coming and chatting in class. And that's something you don't get online. So, yeah. So is it as hard to get into the entrepreneurship program as it is like the MBA program? You might not know that though. Yeah, is, that, different, is, it, is it pretty competitive? Different metrics. Uh, so I think they're looking at different things. MBA is they want you to kind of prove that you're ready to, to manage business at a corporate level, you know, large company. They want to see some different metrics. Obviously, for entrepreneurship, I think that's it's a different route because it's a different mindset. It's a different way of thinking. Um, so I don't know whether... Depends on how you compare like okay. metrics and how rigorous it is. I know it's it's one of the leading programs in the nation. So it's still, you know, it still takes energy and effort to get into the program. But like if you're considering the program, I wouldn't let it slow you down, right? Like there's always a way to achieve that if that's what you want. So why did you pick the entrepreneurship program versus an MBA? Yeah. Uh for me, it just came down to simply the fact that I wanted to change things up. I was working in corporate America. I was at Microsoft, I was at uh, large tech companies, and I knew that an MBA, I had done some courses through like NCAD and some other like graduate level courses in business. And I knew that an MBA wasn't necessarily going to further my career where I was at, but I wanted to shift gears into more startup mode. And I knew I didn't have necessarily the experience under my belt to do that. So it was a nice acceleration of that transition for me. So how do you time with these big corporations help you being a startup founder? Yeah, like how do I take that experience in corporate America? Yeah, um, great question. My first job out of undergrad was at Microsoft, which I am extremely grateful for. I learned so much so fast. And I think there's a lot of understanding of how systems work and how businesses work that is just foundational and really useful. It's one thing to learn something in a classroom. It's another thing to be, you know, my, my first year out of undergrad, I just remember I was, I was kind of a licensing specialist. So working on these large contracts for Microsoft and there were the CTOs and CIOs of large companies calling me on my cell phone, asking about their agreement and their, you know, licensing and software. And that's just an experience you don't get in the classroom or anywhere else. And it was just really an acceleration of learning of like how business operates in the real world. So. From your point of view, is there a leading, is there a difference between like managing or leading people in a big corporations versus a startup? Or is, or is leading and managing the same regardless of the size of the organization? Yeah, I, so I'm not an expert on this. I'm learning every day on how to, and right now in my own company, you know, it's just, it's just myself and a co-founder. So there's not, there's no people to manage. Um, there's that relationship to manage, but beyond that, it's nothing else. So I wouldn't say I'm the expert there, but I will say 
what I've experienced working in a startup and working in a corporation, there definitely needs to be a different type of leadership. And I think it's, you know, I have a lot of empathy for founder CEOs who take an idea from just an idea to validate it, to building out product, to scaling a company. I think there's a different leadership needed at every level and a different type of manager needed. And I think it's really hard to make that transition as you go, especially if you're a venture capital backed startup that's trying to scale really fast. I, you know, I'm always impressed with people that can do it because I look at it and I've seen kind of the inner workings of what that's like of managing investors, taking an idea, turning nothing into something while managing all these other things. I think it's really impressive. I think it's extremely difficult to do. And I, I think it's a, a rare breed of person that can really do that. Yeah, I know there are say if you're a startup founder, like don't bring in like a C-level marketing person from Microsoft, right? Because they'll come in like not want to do any work, you know, so have a team of 20, 30 people, right? Like no yeah. guy, like you're, you're the marketing person by yourself, right? That's someone gives all the equity for, you got to do yourself, right? And a lot of them can't do it, I don't think. hundred percent. Yeah, I've I definitely observed folks coming from large corporations, whether it was, uh, you know, I guess I won't name names, but like you know, coming from a large corporation into a startup and needing to make that mental shift of like, oh, I don't have 30 different people. I can just email to request something. Like I am those 30 different yeah. people. Like if something needs to be done, I'm doing it. No one's going to update this yeah. Excel spreadsheet for me. Like yeah. I have to be the data entry clerk in the head yep. or whatever it is, you know, a lot yeah. of people have trouble with that. Yeah. It's a big shift, I would say in a big transition. So especially I think the longer you go in like a large company, the more you get ingrained in some of those patterns and you'd really have to break out of those patterns to, to be successful uh, in a startup. Yeah. So talk about you and your co-founder, right? Like, are y'all long-time friends? Uh, you came with an idea together. Can you just tell about some of that co-founder journey? Because I think one of the stats are like most startups fail because, you know, co-founder, you know, break up and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. right? Can you talk through that, please? Yeah, absolutely. It's takes a lot of work, 100%. And I think... You know, I, you'll probably hear this a bunch of different times from a bunch of, bunch of different people, but, you know, agreements are important. Things in writing are important and just open, constant communication. Um, I was fortunate to start a business, Perfect Coffee Water, with my uh, with my brother. So my brother is my co-founder. And of course, some people say that doing business with your family <laughs> can be good or bad, right? Yeah. And I, and I think like doing business with anyone can be good or bad. That would be kind of my follow-up. And I've, I've, I've seen co-founders split at large companies or also, I guess, startups that are scaling. I've seen co-founders split up. Uh, so I've seen a lot. And I think I was fortunate enough to have some of that experience going into starting my own business of like observing different things. And then also, you know, in the, in the entrepreneurship program, we had a class on leadership and our professor has been the interim CEO, Ken Myers. He's a great professor. He's been the interim CEO at a lot of companies. Uh, he knows the Seattle ecosystem, but he shared a lot of wisdom and we read a lot of different cases and a lot of things ahead of time. So nothing can truly prepare you for actually living it out on a day-to-day -day basis, but you know, it helps to hear a lot of different stories ahead of time, and it helps you avoid some of the pitfalls that people may fall into. Uh, so we've successfully been able to manage conflict. I think conflict is a really important part of growth. It's a really important part of life. And I think you have to learn how to manage that well. So, and I think that's part of the journey. So I, he had the experience, he had the technical expertise and I had some of the business expertise and that matched up really nicely to, to kick things off with perfect coffee water. And uh, we don't have the details, but how do y'all decide the equity split between the two of y'all? Yeah. Um, there, I think there's a lot of considerations that go into it. And I think it comes down to what what you value, what you want. And this is where talking to mentors is really helpful. Uh, but we split it up in a way that we thought was fair and equitable for ourselves. And we have ongoing discussions about that as things in life change, you know, sometimes. Um, and to be clear, like Perfect Coffee Water has been a nights and weekends business for us. 
We've both held full-time jobs elsewhere while we've been building it. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's an ongoing conversation and I think there's always room for it to change in the future, but I think keeping that open, honest dialogue with each other is crucial. And, uh, you know, just in business in general, the more honest you can be with yourself, with everyone around you, even sometimes when it seems a little bit uncomfortable or painful, I think that'll, that'll give you the longevity that you're, you're looking for when it comes to being able to sustain this long-term. Cool. And uh, you actually have a, a pretty good background in sales, right? Yeah. Like, I think sort of sales intern. Can you talk about like how doing sales at the beginning helped you out? Helped you out? So my advice to any young person now, like learn sales and learn how to public speak, yeah. right? Those two big things I think are big. Yeah. Uh, I'll plug, I'll plug University of Washington An undergrad program I was in was the sales certificate program. I think they made it a business minor now, like sales and marketing. It, it's still a certificate now. Oh, okay. I, I know a, a guy named Alan Gonzalez has come to our dev match out of start of hall. Okay. He has a guy named Liam Nelson who just with them. He, it is a sales, still sales certificate. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful program. So I wasn't able to get into the business school for undergrad, tried like four times, always got rejected. Um, so I was like, okay, well, I'll get a communication degree so I can get out of this place and start working. And I picked up the sales certificate along the way. Extremely helpful. I think uh, really at a foundational level, it helps you communicate business value, it helps you communicate in general um, and articulate what it is that you're trying to do and trying to move forward. And, you know, really an underlying theme always with sales is education. Anytime you're trying to do something new, you have to educate people, whether that's a conversation with your co-founder on how you see something different or whether that's, you know, selling to customers, you're getting your first few customers, like introducing them to new ideas and new ways of doing things that uh, interrupt their status quo it's crucial. And um, it comes down to guidance for sure. But, you know, practice, practice, practice. I did a lot of case competitions in undergrad and you're pitching and you're throwing out new ideas and you're getting feedback. Um, and then again, you know, all through my career and then in the master's program, you're pitching nonstop throughout that program. And I, with perfect coffee water, I never won any pitch competitions. <laughs> um it was pretty brutal sometimes because I was taking this slightly abstract concept it was, it was niche at the time, you know, it's growing, but people just didn't get it. And there's a couple of ways to take that. You can, you can say, oh, it's really disappointing, not the outcome I wanted. Or you can be like, this is learning. Every opportunity is learning. Um, okay. I didn't win this. Why? You get feedback. They don't understand it. Okay. Why don't they understand it? Why is it not meaningful to them? Um, you just keep gathering that up and you keep refining what you're doing and it becomes a, a positive feedback loop. Can you talk about this? Like, like, can you talk about how many times you got to tell your idea, right? You, you got to tell them a hundred times, 2000 times, 3000 times, right? And basically say, tell the same story over and over again. And you might probably, man, I told this so many times, how come they don't get it? Like, well, because you haven't told this person it, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, communicating in general, right? Everyone's going to perceive different messages, different ways. They all come with their own set of experiences, which then leads to their own bias. Um, they have their own vocabulary, their own language for communicating. I mean, I'm not talking about English versus Spanish, right? But even um, you and I probably have nuances yeah. in our vocabulary and how we understand the world. We both come with a very different set of experiences. So when you apply that to sales, like say I'm trying to sell perfect coffee water, or I'm trying to sell you a software suite to run your business, um, take it's it's really I think the the act of taking that into consideration and learning as quick as possible and figuring out ways to communicate through that, um, I think it is important. Uh, but then also maybe to your point, yeah, understanding are are you even talking to the right person within a business, and I think this becomes more impactful, the larger a business gets, you know, I was selling to organizations that have thousands of employees um, and they might have a CTO, a CIO, a chief security officer and a whole, and then, you know, I, I was on deals back at Microsoft where sometimes it was really important that technology was sold to the CIO or the CTO say, and then it was really important to loop in the purchasing 
and the finance person because they have some key metrics they need to hit for the agreement and things like that. So you'd end up having to pull multiple people in to the decision-making process and understand they all care about very different things. And of course, they're probably all taking vacations different times, have different priorities, yes. have different things to do. And like, yeah. Yeah. And thankfully, I'm all, especially at Microsoft, we, it's a little easier to get around some of those. You say, hey, we have technology mm -hmm. to, to connect anywhere in the world, which is a blessing and a curse, I think, at times. But um, yeah, there's not really the excuse of not being reachable for work. You're like, uh, you work for Microsoft. Yeah. We know we can connect with you, but yeah. So when, you, when your company grows and you bring on an actual salesperson, mm -hmm. what what kind of characteristics or values or skills are you going to look for, for you in the sale, your first salesperson? Great question. Um, I think, and this is for any employee, but having the curiosity to learn and to dive in, I think is crucial. In sales too, I think <laughs> my sales professor, Jack Rhodes at the time at UW always said this and it, it stuck with me, you know, it's a little uh, catchy maybe, but you can listen twice as fast as you can speak. And that's for a reason. Um, I think, uh, you know, listening is a key, key skill and active listening, of course, something that I'm always trying to grow in <laughs> still after all these years, haven't mastered it, but still growing in that. I think that's one of the most important things. Um, and then, you know, the aptitude and the attitude to want to learn. I think there's so many things, like I was mentioning, we have access to so many resources. So I think the ability to just get open, to learn new things. I think that's one of the first things I would look for. So Nick, so you have a business development, sales and marketing, right? All those like, all those like the same things, different things, like, can you break that down? Yeah. And this is, you know, terminology. Everyone's going to have a different de definition for what marketing is specifically, uh, what sales is, business development. I think business development is probably a blanket term that could cover a whole bunch of different activities and within business, anything that lends to you building the business and developing it obviously could fall in that. But um, marketing, I think is more so about telling a story, connecting with consumers. And, um, you know, you, you see in a lot of different you know, marketing materials, you see a funnel, right? And the start of the funnel is like, the awareness piece, people getting introduced to your idea, your project, your brand, whatever it is, um, and then getting educated and then showing interest at, you know, you're working down the funnel. And I think for every company, it looks completely different, whether you're, you're a business selling to consumers or you're a business selling to other businesses. I think that quote unquote marketing funnel looks different. Like the, the customer journey looks different and whether it's always involves sales or it always involves marketing or it's always this mixture. I think that looks different for everyone. Um, yeah, I, that wasn't a good okay, breakdown no, of yeah. different terminology. Sorry, that wasn't probably- No, no worries. Um, who's your perfect customer? Currently for perfect coffee water? Uh, perfect customer would be anyone who brews coffee at home and drinks it, just the coffee itself and really cares about the flavor of the coffee. That's our perfect customer. And so you're working at Microsoft. And after that, you left to work for a startup, right? Yeah. So I did a stint at a, one of their global partners. And then that's when I shifted gears and, and went uh, back to school and started Perfect Coffee Water. Okay. So what made you want to do a startup? What made you want to start your own company? Yeah. I'm crazy. That's why. <laughs> you know what? I, I say that I said all the time. Like, before you start a company, you should be some kind of mental health test you got to take, right? <laughs> Okay, you definitely have to have you have to have something a little off on you to want to start a start a start it's, company. Whether it's a startup, a regular business, mom and pop, or even want to do a franchise or Chick Fil A, you got to has to be some kind of mental health test because yeah. there's something wrong with us, <laughs> no doubt. Honestly, I you know it, it takes a certain yeah a certain aptitude and and it's so much more work than just taking you know orders from someone else, collecting a paycheck, uh, but. For me, it's so much more fulfilling. I think that's what it comes down to is I took a look at how I want to spend my time. And I also was fortunate to, I think, gain a level of financial stability. Um, 
And, you know, I grew up without any money and that wasn't really part of the puzzle for me growing up. I had a great childhood, but there was never finances around. Um, that was something I really sought after. We could dive into the psychology of that another time, probably. But that was something I really pushed for for a long time. And then when I had a level of comfort around that, I started, you know, it's like when you're reaching for something and you you get there and you're like, wait, was this really what I wanted? Yeah, you know, this was, this isn't was the, that it? Or? This experience I thought was going to be, right? Yeah. I'm not as happy as I thought. Yeah, it didn't bring the fulfillment that, you know, I may have uh, subconsciously or consciously thought it might have. And I knew that I love creating. I love creating things. I always have loved building. I worked construction from a really young age. Um, and I really loved creating something, you know, taking nothing and creating something out of it was really fulfilling to me. And I always had a dream to have, you know, an international business, have a brand, create something and put something into the world that would help other people. And whether I was naive or not, <laughs> it's up for debate, I'm sure. Um, but just breaking through the barriers of fear and self-doubt and just creating something, whether it failed or was successful or not, I think was important for my own personal journey. So you talk about this. I don't think most entrepreneurs get this right. You start a company, you hire people, right? Police people hire four or five people, right? You're not only hiring that person, you're also hiring the family, right? Because you got to make sure you bring enough, enough revenue so that person can, you know, pay for the mortgage for family, put from the tables of family, right? I don't think most people get that. Yeah, I that's a journey that I think I've yet to take is hiring people. Um, it's something that scares me a little bit. <laughs> I have seen it go very poorly in startups before where, you know, there's a lot promised and then things come crumbling down and those promises aren't met. And I think it has a big impact on those people's lives. And I've seen that firsthand. So I know there's it feels like a lot of responsibility to be hiring people. And I think that's one of the reasons that kept us pushing, like how much can we do without hiring other yeah. people? We'll hire contractors. We work with a lot of different, you know, companies and services that keep us going and scaling with as much as possible. Cause I think it's such a big responsibility to be hiring someone. I know it's a at will employment mm -hmm. and state. And I think there's healthy discussion and, you know, if you've communicated the risk of a startup to somebody and they really understand yeah. that and they still want to jump in, that's great. But I think there should definitely be more conversations around that and more openness around that. But it's tough. It gets into, yeah. I mean, you're in HR, yeah. right? Yeah. You and could it, probably I, tell yeah. us all about it. I think there's definitely a big Nick Snake Nug where someone's looking for a job, they're like, you know, can't take a chance to be hiring me. You know, I'll learn the job. And come like guy like or, or girl, like, you know, I'm only bring as much revenue, you know. I can't take a chance, you know, I need to start yeah. for it. And I think a lot, a lot of people get confused too. Like a lot of people, I think you, people are going down to two, areas, two, two things, right? And this is my opinion. Like I say 80% of the people out there, you pay them, we'll say you pay them $30 an hour. They're like, you're only paying me $30 an hour. I'm only going to do $30 yeah. a work a week, right? I'm only going to do this. I'm only going to do that. Yeah. Well, 20% of people are like, oh, wow, he's paying me $30 an hour. I need to prove to him I'm worth this. Mm -hmm. If I prove it, I'll get a raise there, right? Yeah. And the top 20% keep on going up and up and up and 80% stay there, you know, because it's my opinion. People disagree with me and that's fine. We're fine and dandy. Yeah. Well, I think in the, the labor market, you will find such a huge range. And I think it comes down to, well, I'm, I'm not an expert here. I, some assumptions I have maybe is that, you know, part of it is your past experiences, mm -hmm. your con oh, yeah, definitely. context and perception of, you know, what resource is and what it means to you. Um, I remember my first job was at Safeway stocking the shelves, making uh seven seventy five an hour, you know, and I was busting my buns, just getting it done and getting, getting those little raises in and, and really working up. Um, but yeah, I mean, you see some people nowadays who are, you know, making 20 something of an hour and of course there's inflation and all this other yeah. stuff, but there's definitely a different attitude sometimes of whether people think they're entitled to things or not, or think yeah. they're worth more. And there's always some level of tension when it comes to, you know, you have the thing, job. why, why should I pay $50 an hour just for hamburgers? All the side, know what you need a living wage, you know? And like you said, the past stuff, like somebody might have a pass for like their employee and the past four bosses pretty much screwed them over each time. Right. Yep. And you might have a boss or like the last four employees screw them over. Right. And if those, those two people come yep. work in the next job, like the, the thing going on. 
Yeah. And I think that's where it's super hard to do. And I, it's easier said than done. It's something I'm still working on is trying to have those open and honest discussions with people. And I, it's also what scares me a little bit about hiring people, right? Like there are certain things that you have to do legally okay. to make sure that you're not doing it, but just trying to have those open conversations with people and understand where they're at. And I think it's fine to part ways, but the more open and honest you can be yeah. around. And, and that's what hey, people mess up all the time. You know, the, the thing is like hire slow, fire fast. Well, first of all, if you're a startup, you shouldn't, you can't be like Amazon, right? Got like 20,000 because you, you, you're hiring you need someone like in two weeks, right? Not too much, right? Yeah. My thing is like, like they say, it will, especially they watch, like if they work out, just let them go, right? But of course, yeah. and then fire fast, no one fires fast, right? Because it's like, hey, I need to fire Jason, but it's his birthday, or I need to fire Jason, it's Christmas. I need to fire, it's yeah. always some excuse, right? For you know, like, I'm working for you for four more months, and everyone that comes is like, damn, um, Garrett, we know Jason's a piece of shit. Why the hell is he still here, right? And then you look bad, right? Yeah, it's not good for anyone in no. that scenario. And I think, uh, you know, I have empathy for leaders that have to make those decisions because this doesn't sound fun to make. I, I haven't been in that position yet. Um, but I think you obviously are doing a disservice to yourself and to everyone around you, including that person, if mm -hmm. you're not that person. making that decisive decision of like, hey, this is not actually working out, like we need to make the call. So again, easier said than done. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I have no experience. Definitely, definitely so, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so you ask like my guests, what advice, why should someone start a business? I'm gonna flip it for you. Why should someone not start a business? Oh, <laughs> um, I mean, it's always good to check your motivation of why you're starting that business. I'd say if you're in it just to make money, I would not recommend it. I would recommend working really hard and going, getting a job at a Fortune 500 company and trying to climb the ladder if you're just concerned about making money. So you make a lot more money working for Microsoft, or Amazon than I doing a startup so. for a while. Yeah, I think so. And I think if you look at the statistics around startups, right, so many of them fail. So it's such a large risk. You do see the sensational stories of huge payouts and equity and it turning into a unicorn and things like that. Like, but that's such a small percentage. And so I think it's really good to have the discipline to net that out for yourself and know what you're getting into. And if if money is your only motivator, like you probably want to take the corporate route. Yeah. And then, you know, Slack is like the story is like, you know, someone will first off for 10 years and, you know, at the end of 10 years, they sell the company, but they only have 1% of equity and they get and getting good money, like they suppose they got two point five million dollars, but two five million, two point five million dollars divided over ten years, over seventy hours a week. You know, that's like mm -hmm. probably less than minimum wage. You know. Yeah, and I think honestly too, like even the last ten years, there's got to be something more than just money that's motivating you. I think there needs to be some something else that's fulfilling, whether it's you love creating or whether you love the challenge of of trying to solve a really difficult problem. Um, there's so many, there's so many interesting, challenging problems to be solved in our world. And I think that's why a lot of people do startups, um, friends working at, you know, battery tech startups. Well, we need more batteries and electrical power and renewable energy sources. But one of the bottlenecks is batteries and having to mine these precious metals. And I think that could be fulfilling for someone if you're out there creating a solution that that's really helping people. I think that's going to drive you much further than the money ever will. Uh, money is just a resource that comes and goes. And um, I think once you've been around enough money, you start to gain that perspective mm -hmm. of what it really is and, and how systems work. But yeah, I would say if money is your only motivator, don't start a business. Yeah. So I'm a believer that only way you feel as an entrepreneur is you just quit, right? But having mm -hmm. said that, when should someone quit, right? Like, should, like suppose you've been working on your company 10 years and you like, you have no, you still have no customers, no product, you know, like, but you still believe in heart, you can do it, right? But like, when should someone say, like, should it be, should a red flag be like, our red flag is like, you know, I'm not going to mortgage the house or I'm not going to use my life insurance, you know, like, what's mm -hmm. your, like, what's your take on those things? That's such a, I'd say that's such a personal, first a question, yeah, personal yeah. question. Yeah. It's different for everyone. I think, something I talk about with my co-founder and perfect coffee water, because this is not a business that's paid us anything. We've put our resources into it. We're bootstrapped. 
Uh, we've also got a grant from UW, which is awesome. But yeah, so we're bootstrapped, we're scrappy, we're we're investing our resources and has yet to return anything to us in a financial sense, uh, which can be <laughs> exhausting over three years, can be disheartening if you allow it to. Um, but, you know, I think we have our our limits and our, you know, we have some metrics in place of things we want to hit and the orders are increasing and our customers are increasing and there's thousands of people around the world who are brewing with perfect coffee water. And that's exciting. And knowing that those people are having a better coffee experience keeps us going. Um, so yeah, I think it's a to decide for yourself. Like, do you have to be making money? Do you need to be making money by a certain time and stick to that, be true to yourself and honor that for yourself. And I think you'll be in a good spot. And you, you and your co-founder are both working full job jobs and perfect coffee. Yeah, at the moment I'm transitioning, but for the most of the the life of the business, we've been working full time. And then can, can you talk it. about the channels of that? Like I can imagine yeah. working full time and doing a start full time. Can you talk about how you like manage that, like time yeah. management, like the getting sleep, taking care of yourself, all that kind of stuff? I know there's a lot of phone at you. Yeah, no, and I I just funny, I don't feel qualified to necessarily, I don't have any advice on how to do it the best. I think that's a learning process for me. Um, there's ebbs and flows to it, just like with anything in life. I think there's cycles, there's energy ebbs and flows. You know, we, we get, you know, James Hoffman, famous coffee YouTuber, you know, reviews our product, loves it. Like that's a huge high moment. Um, and then we have a month where we're a little bit below average in sales and it's like, okay, you're just kind of slogging along. Um, so I think, um, you'll have a bunch of different emotions. So figuring out a way to manage your own emotions um, without diving into like a whole uh, health and wellness podcast mm -hmm. session right yeah. now. I think like the the simple advice I give is find a wellness practice, a way to, to be present with yourself and what you're doing and that you can continually be working toward. I think to make sure you stay healthy I think is important and everyone's going to have a different balance when it comes to that. So of course you need to take care of yourself, but and you might not do this, but how do you need co founder to make sure like you'll check up with each other, make sure each other's like doing well. Like, like I don't need co-founder's name, but you, hey, co-founder, you look kind yeah, of dim today, totally. right? Or yeah, like, yeah. how do you make sure y'all keep each other like the good? Yeah. And this is where I feel fortunate that it is my brother and we've had yeah, a relationship a plus, yeah. ahead of time. Right. But it is really, I've grown a lot as a person through this experience. I think I've become able to communicate better and be more honest with myself and with them. And I think it boils down to having those uncomfortable conversations or what could be uncomfortable, pushing yourself to being really honest. Uh, Cause if you're not honest with yourself, there's no way you're gonna be honest with that other person. And that of course is just gonna lead to poor decision-making. And so trying to push yourself to be as honest as possible and then come to a level of compromise or agreement on, you know, what you're putting into the business over time. And for us, that's changed. There's been seasons where it's like, oh, I have a little more energy and I want to put it into the business. Now it's like, oh, I'm at this food tech startup and I'm working, you know, 70 hours a week. I need to pull back a little bit. You know, can you pick up the slack here or are we okay that we're growing a little bit slower these months? you know, and, and checking in on that. And your brother here in Seattle also? No, he's down in Southern California. Okay. So, yeah. So let's talk, talk about, talk about being a co-founder, like two different locations, you know? I'm yeah, sure it has some pros I, and cons to it. <laughs> I don't advise it. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's been great for us. It's been fine. I, I would prefer to be in person. I love working in person. I love being able to collaborate. So I would take lots of trips down there um, and to make it happen. But I think moving forward for my next venture, things like that, I'll want to be in person with the team. Um, as Especially much as for possible. a new business startup. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and we have so many great technologies that, you know, video call, all these things that make it so easy to connect, which I'm grateful for. But for me, nothing replaces that ability to work in person, to be together and collaborate. Yeah. I should do it by half my podcast over Zoom. And I, I now, now I do it all in person. Right? It's, it's not even close, right? This the like the connection of stuff. Like, yeah. is this Zoom's great and all, or what do you want to call it? What do you want to use? Google Meet, what do you call it? You know, right? But this in person, like you can't beat it, right? Yeah, for sure. It's different, different. So, um, 
So next, talk about your company, Perfect Coffee Water. Yeah, make the I'll make the plug. Yeah, go ahead and make the plug. Uh, Perfect Coffee Water, if you're wondering what this is, this is a product that we created. Um, the origin of the idea was really uh, my co-founder, Cortland, down in California. So was, put up a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, Get there we there. go. So people can see. Uh, Cortland was down working in coffee and working at a cafe. People would come in, they would take classes on how to brew great coffee. And, you know, the, the producers of coffee spend hundreds of hours growing and producing this coffee. Roasters spend hundreds of hours dialing in the perfect roast. And then they sell their beans and then somebody brews it at home. And if they brew it with tap water, it's not going to taste as good as if they have perfect perfect water for coffee brewing. And so he, he would start hearing from these people that would come in and say like, Hey, I learned all the technique. I bought this $24 bag of coffee, specialty coffee beans. I'm brewing it at home. Of course, Southern California notoriously has terrible tap water. Um, oftentimes it's, it's monitored and like you read like the parts per million of certain things and it's way high, like 1600 parts per million. The EPA says, don't drink anything above 500 parts per million. Lo and behold, the tap water is just atrocious. So there's already an issue with water down in Southern California, but more so when people were trying to brew delicious coffee, they're saying, hey, I'm spending this money, putting all this effort into it. It doesn't taste as good at home as it does in the cafe. And he was like, well, what water are you using? Because in the cafe, that a $4,000 water treatment system where reverse osmosis pulls out everything from the water and then puts back in just the right blend of minerals. And that's how they brew their coffee. So he's like, okay. So he started teaching classes on like the water for coffee matters. And then I was visiting him and I said, you know, he, <laughs> he has all this, these minerals, white powder on the counter and a scale out. And I was like, what's going on in the kitchen? You know, what should I be concerned? He's like, no, I'm making water for coffee. And it was this light bulb moment for me. I was like, water for coffee he told me all about it. And then I saw him teach a class that weekend and we did these side-by-side -side tests of like French press with tap water, same coffee, and then um, French press with, you know, dialed in water for brewing coffee. You see people tasting the differences and the light bulbs are just going off. And I turned to him, I said, hey, why don't we do this for other people? Why don't we come up with something that is easy for people to use at home so their coffee can taste good at home, just like it does in the cafe. So that's how we got started. It's a packet of minerals, the solution we came up with um, first off, and we're, we're working on some more stuff, but you just take this one gram sachet, rip it off, and you pour it into a gallon of distilled or reverse osmosis water. So not, not tap water. Correct. Yeah. So you want it to be essentially empty water. How about tap water that goes with like some kind of filter? Yeah, sometimes that can work and that gets a little tricky. And that's also tough to message when it comes to consumers. We always lead with distilled water or reverse osmosis because it's easy to understand. It's a pretty guaranteed you've you've taken pretty much everything out of the water and then you're just putting in the calcium, magnesium, and sodium in the perfect blend that they need. Then how about like bottled water? Yeah. So bottled water is going to have oftentimes it's different for every brand, but like say this Kirkland signature. Um, I know the the company that does a private label and they are adding minerals for taste usually. Um, and of course for hydration a little bit, if you just drink distilled water, you're not going to be very hydrated. You need those electrolytes. That's why there's all those products like noon and liquid IV. You need those minerals, AKA electrolytes to help you stay hydrated. So, um, yeah, you want to add it to empty water. Now, the reason for that obviously is you don't want anything else in there. It's the exact right blend of minerals at the right amount. So the second you get, can you tell us the minerals in there? That's like a trace. Yeah, no, no, it's, um, it's really simple. And that's, that's part of it. Like if people want to make water for coffee at home, they can do it. But the challenge is you got, what do you buy bulk minerals? <laughs> no, right. And then you've yeah. got like a lab grade scale to like yeah. measure out in like point, you know, percentages of a gram. Like it's, it's not a yeah. convenient solution. And we're still working toward a more convenient solution than this. Cause I think this is still tough for some people, right? It's still a barrier. Like I've got to figure out how to get that empty water. Now here in Seattle, you mentioned filtering. So like zero water filters, it's like a five stage filter. It's a little more intense than a Brita. In Seattle, our water is really soft. We 
we have a really low mineral profile. We just have a lot of chlorine, which is really bad for flavor profiles. So if you send it through a zero water filter, you're basically at like zero TDS, which is total dissolved solids. And you're good to go. You could add your perfect coffee right to a gallon of zero water filtered filtered water. And you have a factory here in Seattle that does all this stuff for you? How, how do you actually produce these mineral packets? We work with some partners in the U.S. So okay. the minerals are sourced from the U.S. Honestly, a lot of them come from like the Salt Lake area, mm-hmm. as you can imagine, a lot of minerals out there. And we work with some manufacturing partners. That has been uh, challenging, but we're growing in that. We're learning a lot. And, you know, there's it's the tough part about owning a business and making those decisions around the equipment needed to do something this precise um, minimum is going to cost you like a hundred grand. Yeah. I don't have a hundred grand laying around, nor do I want to go and take financing on a hundred grand right now, as I'm still building out the market, proving out this idea. So that's where you can partner up with folks. Now the challenge is that, that these folks that you go to, they're wonderful and they're knowledgeable and they can do it, but they're expecting, you know, they're, they're working with Nestle. They're working with folks like that. And they're coming Nestle or whoever it is, is coming to them with a PO for like 5 million units, uh, which again, is millions of dollars or whatever. Uh, we don't have that. We're a scrappy little startup. And so it's me trying to convince them like, Hey, can you do this run of X amount of sticks? We know it's small, but it meets your minimums. Let's get this going. Let's scale up. Let's work together. Um, so that's been an interesting journey. So that pack you have, like, how is that like half an ounce, two ounces? How big is that pack? One gram. One gram. So, yeah. Like, can you talk about how you decided or what the process you did to decide that like, one gram equals one gallon of water? I'm sure you like did a lot of tests to figure that out, right? Yeah. So that's all my co-founders, all the, the the coffee chemistry behind that. You know, it's organic chemistry when you're brewing water. You look at the specialty coffee associations. There's, you know, there's starting to be more and more research publications around this as well. But yeah, there are specific parameters for what is going to give you the best taste in the cup. And when it comes to coffee, it's like body, it's mouthfeel, it's flavor, it's acidity. It's all and these He's the one who figured out what the exact minerals are put in there too. Yeah. So part of it is kind of that hard science around the numbers and the calculations. And then part of it is a, a taste test. Does your co-founder so, have like a degree in chemistry or anything like that? No, it's self-taught. Self-taught, okay. So great. yeah, yeah. Super smart. Cortland's really smart, you know, just being in the industry. I, I go back to this all the time. And I just think it's such a unique day and age that we're living in is that anything you want to learn, you can go out and learn it. YouTube University, TikTok University. Honestly, you to there's me, so I mean, many different ways. Yeah, even do is on there. LinkedIn and being able to reach out to different folks. Yeah. And, and even when you really need to, contracting someone or, or paying someone to consult for something. Uh, we've worked with some other chemists, you know. And we've paid them to do some work for us. But um, yeah, he is mostly self-taught in, in the coffee chemistry. So there's some hard science, but then I would say any good consumer product that is really going to land with folks has just loads of consumer testing. So for us, that looked like so many blind coffee taste tests where we would take the same coffee, brewed the same way. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we started with cupping, which is a way of like standard coffee tasting to like reduce the amount of variables. Um, you know, when you're brewing coffee, not to nerd out on it too much. Right. But now we're about to geek out on this. Yeah. 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 (laughs) So bear with us here. Um, if you don't like coffee, I'm sorry, maybe you can still learn something, but, um, there's so many variables that lend to the final brewed solution and the final taste in the cup. It starts with the, the quality of the coffee produced on the farm starts and then goes to, you know, who's, how was it processed? Was it fermented? You know, is it a natural process? There's like a million different terms for not a million. There's a few different terms, right. To describe a lot of different processing methods for taking that coffee cherry and then breaking it down to just the seed inside. And do you ferment some of that cherry to get in some of those flavors? People are fermenting it with fruit now to like infuse different flavors that's controversial in the specialty world, but you know, then you get that seed and then who roasts it and how are they roasting it now? You know, what equipment is being used? There's all this chat about all these different types of coffee roasters. What's the best, what's your, you know, your curves look like for roasting 
temperatures, cooling it off, all these different things, because that's you know, the Maillard reaction. It's molecularly changing in that roasting process. So we're nerding out here. So that's a, that's a variable, right? Then when you get that roasted coffee seed, you've got grind size. How are you breaking that down? You got anywhere from a grinder that's $10 or like those whirly break grinders is chopping the bean, you know, and it's going to give you a really uneven particle distribution for grind size, um, all the way up to grinders. I mean, there's a company called uh, Cometeer. They do like an instant coffee frozen pod. They have a $500,000 coffee grinder in their facility. So you can spend anywhere from probably $5 to $500,000 on a coffee grinder. Um, you know, at home, I do have a pretty expensive consumer machine from Baratza. It's like a Baratza Forte. It's like a thousand dollars, which some people are like, oh my gosh. And like, obviously that's part of the business I'm in. Um, but it really does have an impact on the flavor. And then beyond grinding the coffee, you have hundreds of different methods for extracting that goodness from the coffee. You've got espresso, you're adding all that pressure um, you've got just a pour over that's filtering through a paper filter. You've got French press. Let's just call it full immersion brewing. It's just soaking in there. And then, you know, it's going through a mesh, uh, a metal mesh filter at the end. So a lot of different variables. So when it comes to cupping, um, it's basically a little bowl and there's a certain amount of uh, grams of coffee that go in it and a certain amount of grams of boiling water that go into it. And you try to standardize those variables. So that way you can taste a lot of different coffees and evaluate them next to each other while standardizing the, the, the variables as much as possible. Um, so that helps you to evaluate like the different qualities of different coffees. And it's not just the variable of like, oh, well, I changed the paper filter or like, oh, I poured a little faster this yeah. time or not. Um, there's like a set of protocols you go through. So that was a little bit of a tangent, a little bit of some nerdy coffee great. talk, but I think a lot of it was like blind taste tests of doing cuppings with different water profiles. So we'd have the same exact coffee and different, you'd be changing the, the water formulas. And then we would go and approach coffee profession, professionals, some of which were Q graders, and then some of which were just starting their journey in coffee. So getting a bunch of different, you know, taste buds in the room, I think is important too. And them saying like, oh, I like this one better. And it was as simple as that, right? Like, it's not like, oh, here's the water formula, which do you like? It's just like, which one tastes better for you? So that was kind of a long winded answer to your question of like, how do you come up with, you know, this, this, uh, this product and how do you, uh, are people going to want this, right? Yeah. Like, um, couple different ways as part of it is the hard science part of it it's just those blind taste tests so how do you do this like well, as far as your experience right regardless you're like you do like ground your coffee or just you cake cups whatever this is adding an extra step to the coffee making process how do you act and of course it's only a couple of seconds or whatever you know but how do you convince people hey no it's what these couple of seconds each day to make your coffee better how are you going about mm -hmm. doing that that's a great question i think that's um something we're still testing now i think it's the reason we still consider it a niche market is because I think there's only still a subset of people that care enough about the taste of their coffee that want to go through the effort. Because I'm guessing the, the, the person who goes to the Starbucks drive-thru every day for the coffee, it will not be a customer of yours, right? Correct. They're looking for convenience, quick hit of caffeine. Uh, we could talk all about caffeine, right? It's one of the only legal psychoreactive stimulants, you know, molecules on the market. Right. All the other ones are illegal. So it's, I, I think it's probably part of the reason it's so popular. There's what some people say there's close to 2 billion people who drink coffee daily. I don't know exactly what the numbers are, but definitely over a billion people drink coffee every day, which is hard to wrap your mind around. Um, but I think caffeine is obviously the leading cause of that, right? Like people want that, but secondarily, I think people want it to taste good. And there's a couple different routes you can take to get to good taste. Some people just completely modify it by adding cream and sugar. But then and, are you drinking coffee? Or are you drinking cream and sugar? Yeah, exactly. And um, obviously people extract caffeine from other things too. And yeah, you know, tea is wonderful and all these things. But um, 
but then some people actually enjoy the taste of coffee. And then I think when you go down the rabbit hole of coffee science and things like that, you really get into all these different taste profiles and it becomes like a wine where people really get into all the different processing methods and the different varietals and the Tipica, is it SL28? Is it Gesha? Is it, uh, there's a bunch of different coffee varieties too. So you can get really nerdy on that. Um, I think I got a little sidetracked. I was talking <laughs> about, I got sidetracked with caffeine. No worries. Um, but yeah, I think that's a big, big reason people, oh, it's answer your question around like, who's the customer? Right? Yeah. And so I, yeah, if you're going, how are you going to basically take the extra step to yeah. use your product? Yeah. So yeah, if you're just looking for convenience, it's not necessarily the target market. So you're, you're more um, like the art of making coffee. Like you look for someone like has a grinder at home. They're going to grind, they're going to go somewhere, not probably not Starbucks, some specialty coffee shop, you know, or yeah. the coffee grounds, like how they want it, grind them up in the morning and do the whole, the whole art process, so to speak. Right. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, there's such a big variety of how people brew coffee too. So, and, and we, I guess we do, I'll clarify, we do support like small businesses. People have coffee carts and they're doing five gallon um, jugs of water. That's like what their espresso machine is feeding off of or things like that. We support them with perfect coffee water because obviously they want their product to taste really good that they're selling every day. Um, so we support them, but we're just, we're it's not a product that's built for like, scale in a cafe because in a cafe you need it direct inline solutions that are pumping out you know hundreds of drinks per day or whatever uh, this is more a little more manual involved um now that being said we're always thinking about how can we make this more convenient right like can we, how can we get the consumer just the finished water right is one idea how can we give them different tools to make it a little bit easier to like quickly added into their water, filtered water on the go. So I won't spill the beans on new products that we're working on, but we're always trying to tune into the consumer. I think it's such a new concept in general. Like this solution works great for a lot of people and it's nice that we can ship it around the world. I think we shipped to over 35 countries and that's fantastic, but we're always trying to make it more convenient for the consumer because convenience just rules the market. Um, we see it over and over again with any consumer product. Like, how do you make it more convenient? You know? And yeah, like some kind of subscription model where someone can buy like a 10 grams a month or something like that, or how does that work? Yeah, and I should have brought it, but we just have a 15 count box. Um, again, we're a little bit light on our, our SKUs right now. We're out of stock on the five gallon um, ones, which are coming back to stock in a couple months. Um, part of the manufacturing joys, but yeah, you can subscribe to a box of perfect coffee water, change it whenever you want. We have a bunch of subscribers and it's fun to see, you know, you could tell they're drinking different amounts of coffee at different times. Cause they're like, Oh, I need the ship sooner. Oh, I need to push that out a couple of weeks. So, you know, the classic subscription where they have full control over when it ships, you can cancel at any time. Um, but yeah, they're getting those packets right to their door. And is a perfect coffee. Does it come like different flavors? Or is this a one mineral pack? No, so it's just the minerals. Okay. So what's happening is these three minerals in the right balance are affecting the coffee extraction, like what flavors are being extracted from the beans. And that's why you're getting less bitter notes, um, less uh, acidity sometimes, you know, you're getting a smoother, a perceived sweeter coffee. So. And how long have you been drinking coffee? When did you start drinking coffee? Uh, college, I think is college, the big, okay. yeah. And I had that, I was drinking, uh, so the big, the big old Starbucks, of course, here in Seattle, going to UW, I was drinking all these lattes all the time. And a big part of my personal journey and why I was excited about creating perfect coffee water is that I was drinking so much dairy and sugar. And I started as I was getting older, I was like, ah, I don't feel the best after having all this sugar and all this dairy. And no judgment to anyone who drinks a lot of sugar and dairy, but it wasn't working out for me. And I started to learn about the effects of sugar on your body and on your brain and how it can be toxic and all these other things. I was like, okay, well, I still want caffeine. Um, and that's when Cortland, the co-founder, actually started to teach me how to brew good coffee. And I, you know, everyone has this, if you talk to anyone who's been in specialty coffee long enough, like everyone's had this experience where they drink this like pour over coffee. It just tastes like blueberries and it's super fruity. And you're like, how does coffee taste like that? Well, I had one of those experiences and it really opened my eyes to like, okay, I can make 
brewed coffee that tastes delicious. I really enjoy, and I don't have to add cream or sugar. So there's like no calories, right? A few calories, whatever. And it's delicious. And so I then shifted my ritual to that and it really opened my eyes. So when obviously I found a solution for home brewers, especially in parts of the world where the water is not the best, where they could have the best water for brewing coffee to ensure that they were going to have great tasting coffee. It's really exciting to me. And it's really fun to see the customer feedback come back. What's the best coffee you've had so far? Then I'll tell you mine after you answer. That is a, it's always tough. And, um, you know, it's like, I love all my children yeah. type of situation. Yeah. I have no children, but, um, I've had so many incredible, I I'm so fortunate and privileged to have so many amazing tasting coffees because of, uh, the industry I work in and, you know, the, the companies that we support. So we, we support some of the world's best coffee roasters. And uh, I know I'm very privileged in having access to that, but one of my personal favorites, I'll give him a plug, Mikava Coffee, it's M-I-K-A-V-A, Mikava. They have a farm in Colombia, and then they actually roast themselves. And they've won, there's an award called Cup of Excellence. It's a nonprofit, I think, or it's like a third party um, authorizing body. And they like test all these coffees and they come up with like, who's the Cup of Excellence winner? Um, and there's also like scoring guides yeah. for tasting, just like there is for wine. Right. Um, but yeah, it was a really nice, yeah, sure. It was a natural process. I mean, it was like fermented with some of the fruit and, um, I don't want to butcher the actual real process. So <laughs> go and look them up. They have videos on it. You can see videos of their farm in Columbia and stuff like that, but it's just a very floral fruity. Um, my friends call it a dessert coffee. Because for having no sugar in yeah. it, it's like incredibly smooth and perceived sweetness. Uh, so yeah, that's my favorite coffee right Yeah, now. mine's a little bit more vague. So my best coffee was, was in Italy for Tears Army. Mm. Italian coffee was just like above and beyond anything yeah. I've had, right? It was just so good, right? And they're, they're the, uh, you know, the OGs when it comes to espresso. Yeah, Were you drinking right. espresso? espresso? Yeah, uh, I used to drink these products called Cafe Corrector de Grappa. It's like a little espresso. You put a set of grappa in it. Grappa is like their like tequila, mm. Italian tequila, whatever. Yeah. It's like, it's like when they make the wine, the the the, the throwaway grapes, they make the grapple out of that. So like it's like ugh, like ten thousand percent alcohol, right? Yeah. I, I was addicted to that crap. That's like Yeah, I it's so fun to hear about you know, coffees all around the world, but how that expression of coffee changes depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh one I'll give this a little tangent. So we are the official water of the World Aeropress Championship. This year, we're going to be heading out to Australia nice. for the real competition. And I think it'll be around 60 competitors from 60 different countries that come together. And uh, we, we did this last year in Vancouver, BC. And it is so fun to see, you know, someone from Australia or the Philippines or Indonesia, and they come and compete. And it's just one coffee brewer with the same coffee and the same water, all perfect coffee water, right? And they're brewing all these different tasting coffees. And it's really phenomenal to see just the variety and variance in what you can do with one brewer, one coffee, and the same water. And you can make the coffee taste a bunch of different ways, which is pretty fascinating. So I, I could be as well, like Indonesia, Colombia, some countries after like, no, if like you have great coffee, coffee beans, I mean, what's a country out there like makes Great coffee beans that most people don't know about. It's like I, off the wall. I don't know. I don't think I have anything super surprising for that. I think it's it comes down to preference a little bit. So I love Central American coffees like El Salvador, Costa Rica. You know, there's something slightly different about them. I love that taste profile. My co-founder really loves... Uh, you know, coffees from Kenya. They're very distinct, um, different. Honestly, though, I've had coffees from so many different countries that are incredible. I didn't think that I like Indonesian coffees that much, but recently I've been having some from certain producers and roasters that they've just totally changed the game on how they're processing it and roasting it. And now I'm like, oh, I like this. This is incredible. It fits my taste profile a little bit more. Um, so I think that's one thing that's fun about coffee is it's always changing, but I don't know about a certain country. 
Yeah, I don't, I, there's so many countries that produce and so such coffee, good coffee. Usually comes like hot weather countries like that. Like you, you don't get coffee brewed like no Norway or Finland or. Correct. Yeah, okay. there's like the coffee belt, similar okay. like uh, chocolate. If you're mm -hmm. familiar, you ever done like the tour over at the Theo Chocolate Factory here in Seattle or something like that? You, there's it requires and, and you know, I'm not a coffee farm. There's people that could speak to this way better than I can. So go go and research that if you're interested. But basically elevation plays a big role and you know um where you're at in the world there's kind of that coffee belt it needs to be hot enough you need to be at high elevation um yeah so you hear a lot of time like companies like starbucks or where they can be though those they'll say like this coffee is like um i can't think of the word like um basically they're saying that they're they're taking their their um they're not taking advantage of the farm of the land like they're I can't think of what i'm looking for like not climate based like something resource coffee, like, is that really important? You, you know what I'm saying? Like, can the, I can't think of the term of it were. Yeah. Um, well, I can, I'm thinking of a few different things as you're saying this, like coffee is an agricultural crop. It's very resource intensive. So it's grown at high altitude. There's a lot of water needed, a lot of sun, you know, there's some not so pleasant parts when you think about how to keep up with demand for coffee. Sometimes there's deforestation. People take down a whole big old forest and just monocrop coffee. Probably not good for anyone involved in that. Uh, the history of coffee is really interesting. There, you know, I won't cast judgment one way or the other on it, but um, I think there's a book called Coffee Land, which really dives into the history in El Salvador alone. Um, some would say that's really steeped in colonialism. I don't know where you're going with this. There's a lot of, there's a lot of like really interesting things about the history of coffee, yeah. which I'm sure someone ca would cast the judgment, good or yeah. bad. And then there's also same thing with tea, the British Empire in India. You know, the, the yep. British Empire, the man, the what's it called? They should have the the tea company or something like that. The British Tea Company. Yeah, uh, I don't know any of that history to be yeah. honest, but there absolutely is loads of history around tea. I'm sure and politically and how that all mm -hmm. you know went down and and i have no idea if this is true or not but i just came to my mind like the, supposedly you may know this may not know this i could be making this up but supposedly there was like a tribe of people in an african country right somewhere and they was tired had the goats animals they was tired or whatever and these goats find these like the beans right they eat the beans yeah. and they were like hyped up right like they're so hyped up like man these goats are like barely making other hyped up right yeah and they they took a bite like this is horrible well you know putting it you know in the, oh, in, the, in the fire yeah and that's how cough got started right i have no idea yeah. that's true or not um, it's, it's, it's a good story I know you're is. testing my history of coffee i've read all this at one point it's not locked into memory but I, yeah. Yeah, that sounds you know i think it's caldy or yeah. something is this the story of how this yeah. coffee was discovered and the dancing goats yeah and, yeah dancing goats yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. Remember that, yeah. Is it made up? Probably so, but it still makes a good story, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the story of, uh, there's a lot of interesting history. People want to get into it around how, you know, plants were brought to different countries mm -hmm. and, you know, some colonies and some things like that. And even how coffee was stolen from time to time and brought different places to be propagated. So here's one for you. What is a bad way to make coffee? Uh, use perfect coffee. Of course. <laughs> uh, no, I'd say it's an interesting question to answer only because there's so many different ways to make coffee, but I would be say, bad for me. It might be great for you. Right. That's the thing yeah. too. It's, it's taste. So it's very subjective, but there are some general key themes I think you can follow, which is like people usually want less bitter notes. Yeah. They want more clarity of flavors. Um, so that's some things, obviously we, we really um, took into account when creating perfect coffee water. That's what we aim for. But I would say if you're brewing coffee at home, there's like three, because there's a, whether you're using an espresso or a K-cup machine or anything like that, like check your water, like at the bare minimum, use filtered water, right? Okay. If you don't want to buy perfect coffee water, totally fine. But filter your water, get the chlorine out of it, get the fluoride out of it. Those are two things that are really heavy in our tap water here in Seattle and many places in the world. And get those out of it because those will mess with your flavor profiles. And then if you're trying to up the quality, like think about the coffee beans you're buying. Like if you head more toward like a specialty coffee roaster, like here in Seattle, you have like Elm coffee roasters. You've got um, 
Kuma coffee roasters. There's a whole bunch of them, but like go and try to, you know, and I always say to try to buy local. It's always nicer. We can get it freshly roasted. Um, so the quality and the freshness of the coffee will play into that. Um, and then if you are doing more of a manual brew or an espresso, like you start to get big differences in grinder quality. So if you want to up your coffee game, check out getting a new gr- coffee grinder. Um, and then like, there's a bunch of YouTube resources, Yeah. Uh, you know, James Hoffman, Lance Hedrick, all these folks that are educating people all the time on how to brew better coffee at home. So if you have specific way you brew coffee, like go on YouTube, how to brew X better, like how to make better, you know, pour over. And distilled water is better than bottled water for coffee. So you, no, not necessarily. So uh, distilled is what you want for adding perfect coffee water okay. minerals. So you want the empty water, add perfect coffee water. You've got the perfect blend of minerals. Now, if you want to be more convenient and you care less about the taste, go for like a crystal geyser. Okay. They've got some minerals in there. So you're going to get some minerals to extract good flavor, but then it's going to be filtered. You're not going to have the other um, you're not gonna have any nonsense outside of that, but you're gonna have some good minerals. How much coffee do you drink each day? I try to limit it to about one or two cups. One or two cups. Yeah. I'm a little sensitive to caffeine. So if I drink it past noon, I'm like wired. Yeah. I bet like midnight. Yeah. My, mine's yeah. 2 p.m. Yeah. When was the last time you did not drink coffee for the whole day? Hmm. You stumped me with this one. In a while, right? It's been a while. Okay. Probably a couple of years ago. Okay. All right. Yeah. Nice. Um, it's like caffeine's a pretty addictive drug. <laughs> yeah. Pretty illegal I, addictive drug. I, yeah. I will. Um, yeah. Hopefully I'm not labeling this podcast by saying that. <laughs> Sorry. I should use specific terminology. Um, caffeine is an addictive um, substance, but that's probably even worse. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I will get a headache if I don't. Yeah. Drink it. Uh, Michael Pollan has a really interesting book about caffeine. I forget what it's called. I think it's called Caffeine. It's like a couple hour audio book, um, but it just kind of dives into a little bit of the history of it, but just kind of the effect that it has. It's not that it like gives us energy. It's just that it's tricking us. And yeah. We're not as tired. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So back to being an entrepreneur, mm-hmm. like each day, you know, you have probably like 10, 15 things you want to do. I'm sure you like prioritize them one through whatever the number is. Mm-hmm. How do you make sure you start working on numbers one and two versus starting at number 10 or 11? That is a, that is a learning process. <laughs> it's still in process. I think always writing things down and making your list helps you visualize like what's more important. And then better yet, if you have someone else to bump that list on, like, my co-founder, for example, like, Hey, here's my hit list of things that I want to get done this week, this month, this quarter, what's the most important. And I think always coming back to prioritizing, like it's, it's a never ending pursuit because you're always going to have things that pop up. Um, there's of course a million, it's an exaggeration. There are quite a few softwares out there that will help you visualize your tasks, whether it's notion or Trello or, Asana, you name it. I've used most of them. Honestly, half the time we'll just stick to pen and paper while our team's small. It's not, it's not scalable. It's not sustainable, but it works for me half the time. So that's what I'm doing. Just writing it down. It's important. Besides pen and paper, do you have any like favorite part productivity tools that you use or going to use once your team grows? I've been checking out uh, Notion, I believe it's called. Yeah. I know a lot of people love right. Notion. It's like, a bummer level right now. It's like it's a lot to get into. Yeah. I'm not there yet. So but I know a lot of people just love it. To death. Yeah. Trello was a really easy start for us, just creating those cards and just having a way to visualize. Need to do, doing, done. That's nice. Um, I've used a sauna, like it's a little too involved for me. Like it's too many. My brain doesn't work that way. I'm not, I think people's brains do work differently yeah. when it comes to organizing tasks. I like to be a little more creative. I'm coming up with different marketing things. I'm connecting with people all day. That's maybe more my skill set than like the pure project management. Um, although I've managed plenty of projects to find. Uh, I really liked, uh, what was it? Was there Airtable? Does that sound familiar? Airtable, yeah. Airtable, yeah. I've used that. Yeah. I, I like the simplicity of it. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't say I have a favorite. 
Okay. So what are you doing for marketing? Like you like pushing stuff organically on Instagram or like how are you marketing the company? Yes. Uh, Instagram really has been one of our main channels. Um, it's word of mouth and it's Instagram. I think Instagram and social media in general, I get really exhausted. So I got to set parameters around it. But the power of it is that you get a consumer that connects with your product and they're like, oh, perfect coffee water made my brewing experience so much better. You know, my coffee is so much more delicious. We've had plenty of people that start brewing with perfect coffee water and then they run out and they're like, oh, like my coffee was horrible today because I didn't have it. You know, it's like you get people that are get connected to the brand and it's really powerful when they have a platform to talk about it, which is social media. So we've had a lot of people, you know, organically post about perfect coffee water. Hey, this is my brewing ritual. And it's, uh, I think, really valuable to be able to see and hear someone that you have some level of trust in saying like, oh, I like this product. So I think it's a powerful tool. We haven't done any paid advertising. Okay. Uh, um, so no, none of the traditional like media, I think yeah. that's something we'll get. I saw an later. article on LinkedIn recently where this guy did some kind of study. I have no idea this. Of course you presume this guy is qualified to do a study, right? So I'll throw that out there. I thought he did a study and, and he was able to prove according to him that you should not do paid ads on, on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn because it's not worth it. Right. Yeah. I think it depends on your business, where your audience is at, um, I, I, when I was doing the research for perfect coffee water and building the business plan and all these things, I realized that there was our, our, what I call our beachhead market, like our first customers that we wanted to connect with the people that really cared about coffee. There was a growing community of those people on Instagram. So I kind of identified that. And that's why we put energy and effort there. And I think it's important. I would give this advice to any other startup out there that's just getting going find out where your target audience is, find out where they're communicating, where they're living, right? And I say living in quotations, you know, for us, it was these coffee, uh, people that really care about the quality of their coffee. They were on Instagram, they were sharing photos, they were sharing videos. And so that's where we decided to connect with them first. Now, that being said, I think once you start to build your own brand, and communicate with customers directly, I think another powerful tool is email. Uh, it's that direct line of communication yeah. where that consumer is opted in to hear from you mm -hmm. and you get the opportunity to share stories with them. Um, that has been helpful and powerful for us as well. For your uh, subscriptions, yeah. is it like month a month, six months, four months, a year, or is this different ones? Anytime they want. So okay. it depends on the consumer. You know, I think it's a lot of times we'll see like every 10 weeks or every eight weeks. Okay. Like it's kind of roughly, if you're drinking coffee every day, you buy a 15 count box of our, our packets and it's going to last you about two months. Some people don't drink coffee that often or they have coffee at the office. It's free and they just drink it on the weekends and they're doing like every, you know, three or four months, they're ordering a box, that type of thing. Are you able to track like how often like people reorder your coffee? Like, uh, like how is how's your like recurring customers going? How are you tracking that? Yeah, so there's a lot of um, great tools just out of the box that help us give all those metrics. So Shopify, right, is leading e-commerce platform that's really helpful. And then Recharge is like our plugin for subscriptions. And it'll give you all the metrics, like what's the frequency that they buy. Even for Shopify, we can see like, oh, maybe they bought the, the three-pack starter pack just to test it out. And then they reordered the larger box at a better price and things like that. You start to glean all these insights about your consumers. You can see how often they're ordering and it helps you gain some level of insight into how you should be further developing products. How do you do this? Like you, like you kind of joke, like there's a million product tools, right? I mean, there's so many tools for everything, right? Mm -hmm. How do you all decide what tools you use? Like, do you like, you like, you like, Google and, and test the first 10 recommendations. Like there's too many tools out there, right? Like how do you like, yeah. you can't test can all of them, right? Yeah, yeah, it could be a big time suck. I would say this is where mentors and community plays a big role for me. I'm like a big, I do want to test it out myself. So I do, I do trials of software and I really want to understand the system and grasp like the potential of it for myself. But also I rely a lot on, you know, I know multiple other founders of CPG companies and we have conversations, what's working for you, what's not working. That saves you a lot of time. Um, really value. There's a community called startup CPG. 
and they have a Slack channel. You sign up for it. If you're a brand or an entrepreneur and you're, you're doing something in the CPG space, so whether it's health or beauty or um, snacks or whatever it is, that's, you know, going to go in a grocery store eventually join this community. People chat about different things they do for operations, for e-commerce, for marketing, super valuable. It saves you a lot of time just to be able to reach out to someone and say, Hey, can I get like five, 10 minutes and hear about your experience with X, you know? Yeah. Well, people don't realize like, I mean, just my experience, 95% of people I've asked for help have said yes. Yep. Of course you can have like 5% jackasses, jerky voice are calling right. You're like, you know, won't give you the time of day, but most people want to help you. Yeah. I think, um, you don't, you don't get what you don't ask for. Exactly. Right? What's I, the thing? A closed mouth. Don't get filled or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, definitely. I, that was a big part of being in the entrepreneurship program too. It's just that encouragement to like get out there and ask people, try new things. And yeah, you could always, they could say no, they could fail. But like, when you really think about what's the worst that could happen yeah. <laughs> when you're asking someone I mean, for help, yeah, it's a no. no. It's like they're, gonna throw you, they're not going to throw yeah. you in jail. Yeah. You're not going to have 10 years of your life taken off, you yeah. know, like, yeah. So glean from that. Also, I think, you know, it's funny, I'm on a podcast right now, right? But I have learned a lot from podcasts. And I always critically analyze that. Uh, so you guys should be analyzing what I'm saying with your own lens, right? Your critical thought, but it can be helpful and valuable. And I, I throw it on in the background and I hearing other founder stories and you pick up little nuggets here and there about like, oh, that's what they did or that's how yeah. they accomplished that. And then that also helps to dictate like what path we're taking. And sometimes that also dictates like, oh, we want these tools to accomplish it. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, suppose you have 10 founders, suppose you have 20 founders out there, right? Yeah. 10 that I can fail, right? Just because those 10 failed, there are different ways on me going to fail, right? And then yeah. vice versa, 10 founders might succeed, each has their own different path. Those paths might, might work for you. Only only work, what's going to work for you is going to work for you, right? You have to yeah. figure that yourself, right? 100%. And I think that's... Um, you know, I even find myself caught up in that sometimes, like you got to make sure you live your own story and you're analyzing things for yourself because it's easy to, it's easy to compare or it's easy to say, oh, I should be further along because so-and-so is, or X company is, or. Yeah. That's, that's, know, that's or, I find myself doing that. I, I joke around, but I'm serious. I'm talking like, where am I today? I should be here like a year and a half, two years ago. Right. And of course, another thing founders would do, like, what's, what's it called? Uh, seeing the forest of the trees or so in the ground. Right. Like sometimes you got to look up and say, wow, six months ago, I was over here. Now I'm here. Right. Even yeah. though, you know, mine, you're not making progress. You actually made a lot of progress. Yeah. Those reflection points, I think are really valuable. Um, you know, we were part of the accelerator program after, after I graduated UW, we were part of this accelerator program. It was really helpful. So we got great mentorship, but it also, you lay out milestones and then at the end of the seven month program, you look back and say, oh, wow, we hit that milestone. Like, it's kind of like starting a class at the beginning of the quarter. You look at the syllabus and you're like, oh, there's no gosh, way I can like, do this. Oh, this is so overwhelming, exhausting. And then you just get after it and you keep yeah. moving forward and you get the community around you that's going to support you. You get the the trusted advisors mm -hmm. that will give you the candid feedback. You know, you get those things in place and you just keep moving forward. You find ways to take care of yourself. And then you look back and you're like, whoa, like what we've accomplished, like, when we started Perfect Coffee Water, obviously we have great ambition and we're still, my goal is to you know, help a million people brew better coffee at home. And then I have some ancillary, you know, personal goals of helping people get clean water and stuff. Like that's my own um, kind of motivation and reason for doing this as well. But there, you know, we've helped thousands of people around the world, but we're still well on our way to helping a million people. And um because those thousand people saw two people that's two thousand those two thousand about you know and it's double double yep. double it grows and um you know as we build traction it's exciting but i think it's even important now to stop and say like wow that's thousands of people around the world that are having a better coffee experience because of something we created and we decided to go out and do um i think it's valuable it's not it shouldn't be ego driven but i think it's it helps put things into perspective and remind yourself of, of why you're doing it. So you, of course, you already talked about your company somewhat. Can you go more detail, like how the company got started? What the focus on right now and what your big dream vision is it for going towards the future? Yeah. So when it comes to perfect coffee water, it just, it was really born out of that desire to help people brew better coffee at home and seeing my brother teach his classes, um, seeing people's eyes light up 
when they're having a better coffee experience. And that was really the impetus for getting started. Um, we've created this solution, which I think I mentioned, it's still not the most convenient ever. And so I think there's still this goal and desire to try to make it more convenient for people to reach a broader audience. Um, so in the future, keep an eye on us. We'll, we'll create some new products that'll help people um, brew coffee. But I think for this company, and and I don't necessarily have a grander vision outside of, you know, this will be hopefully helping people brew the best coffee possible for years to come. But outside of that, I think that's just what it is. There's nothing really beyond that. So is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Not that I can think of. Kind of wish I would have asked you more questions. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> and can you share your social media for yourself and company so people can reach out to you? Yeah. So I'm on LinkedIn all the time, chatting with folks and helping entrepreneurs and students and always happy to do that. And then also, you know, Perfect Coffee Water on Instagram, as well as brew at Perfect Coffee Water. So. Uh, and can you give us any minute, last minute advice on anything you want to talk about? Yeah. Uh, stay curious. Uh, stay. Uh, what is it that showed? Ted Lasso recently. Mm. It's just a nice little reminder, right? I think to do anything important and to head in the direction you want to go, stay curious, non judgmental, keep learning. Um, you know, as cliche as it sounds, like take an opportunity or take a, an experience where you didn't get the outcome you wanted and say, what can I learn from this versus being, you know, just disappointed about failing? Like it's that, it's that mindset shift especially if you're going to do something entrepreneurial, you've got to get really comfortable with not getting the outcome you want and learning as quick as possible from it. Garrett, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Likewise. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to Amy Swanson. She introduced us, us today. So shout out to Amy. Uh, reminder her, Kevin say try. We're doing a crowdfunding campaign starting pretty soon. Go to H HTTPS. Uh, what's it called? Colons backslash backslash refunded.com slash Kevin's HR. Also, we're doing a pitch competition on July 25th. Um, thank you for your time today, and remember to be great every day.